and I am a county master gardener. And um, the first thing I wanted to the first thing I wanted to do with you guys is on top you should have something that says "be trivia questions." So we're going to kind of like uh, give you a pretest, seeing how much you know about about uh, the native bees. Um, so. In case you didn't know it, um, you also have this sheet that has all the uh, six families of native bees that are present in North America. There is a seventh family of which no species of that family are present in on North America. So if they're not here, where do you think they might be found? What would be your guess from Canada? Australia. Australia is correct. Wow. There is a species of native bee that only exists in Australia, a, a, a family of native bees. So they're not on your list because chances of us encountering them here are pretty slim. Um, bees pollinate what percentage of the world's main crops? 75. You're good. You must be studying your bees. I have a lot of bees. How many eyes does a bee have? More than two. More than two. That's okay. all I know. Is there a pen somewhere? Yeah, there's some out there on the um, I'll grab you. On the thing. Thank you. Six. Um uh, close. Five. So these have five eyes. They have two on the sides that are the compound eyes, and that's what they use to actually see. And bees can't see in color, so they have these compound eyes. But then they also have three additional eyes on the top of their head that are used to um, basically determine the light level of light. They just see light and dark, but their two eyes on the sides see everything else. So they can't see in color, as we said, but there's one color they can't see. They're colorblind with one color. Red. Yeah. Um, yeah. The pollinators, like with flowers, do you think red would be like a Yeah, they, I don't know how, I'm not sure how it looks to them. I'm assuming it's probably as looks black or gray, usually when you can't see a color. Um, where do most bees nest? In the ground. Yes, very good. Oh. Most bees are actually underground, have underground nests, and we'll learn more about that today. And um, what is the number one cause of bee decline in the world? Uh, habitat loss. Habitat loss is the number one cause. All of these causes are part of it, but that's the, the one that's affecting them the most. So that's why we're going to talk a lot about um, raising native plants. And Kathy Doyle out there is our native plant expert. So uh, she can fill in if you guys have more questions because I'm really, really focusing on the bees more than the plants. Um, but I do have a lot of information for you about, about the plants and about the specific bee families, um, bee species and what kind of plants they like. So that'll be in the, in the presentation. Okay, so you can put that aside um, if you want. And, um, I like to, when I'm doing in person, I like to do a lot of interactive. I kind of miss that from being on Zoom where I just talk and it's um, talking to my computer. So um, it's really cool to see your faces. Thank you for being here. Um, and I will periodically ask for uh, feedback about things during the, the course of this. So um, anybody want to uh, volunteer why they think bees are so important? Pollination, yep. Um, but we have other things that pollinate too, right? Butterflies, wasps, um, lots of beetles and different things pollinate. But what is special about bees? Mm, only one kind of bee makes honey and they're not native. Uh -huh. Okay, so what, what it's, it's all about the hairs. So bees are fuzzy, right? You see, if you look at bees, you notice all that fuzz. The fuzz, the hair on their bodies makes them better pollinators than any other type of pollinator out there because the pollen sticks to those hairs. That's what, what its purpose is. And that's how they're better at pollinating. They also, many, many, many bees are generalists, which we'll talk about in a minute, which means they visit everything. So they tend to go from flower to flower to flower to flower. And in doing that, they do some cross-pollinating. 
which is important because a lot of crops like fruits and kind of things have to be cross pollinated um, because or they won't produce fruit. So that's really important. Um, so a lot of it is is um, is pollinated by bees. A lot of things like grains, wheat, and those kinds of crops are pollinated by the wind instead of bees. And wind is out there, and wind will pollinate your vegetables and fruits. But what happens is it's so in, in, inefficient at pollination that um, you'll end up getting uh, fruits that are uh, poor yield or smaller size or just poor quality if they're not pollinated by bees also. Does anybody grow cucumbers? Has anybody ever had a year where your cucumbers are all deformed yeah. and like one end is fat and the other end is skinny it's and that kind of thing? Like a, that's a sign of poor it. pollination. Oh. That's what that is. That's caused by poor pollination. And if yeah. you're not having, here. <laughs> if you don't have enough bees, then you might get deformed cucumbers. Or that's just an example because I have, I've had this problem. You can hand pollinate cucumbers. That's a whole different course. So you can play like a bee and use a, 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 paint, a little paintbrush or a Q-tip even, and just pretend like you're a bee and go from plant to plant. Because mm -hmm. um, cucumbers have male flowers and female flowers, so they need to go from one to the other. If you don't have a bee, then how does it get there? You know, wind just doesn't do it. Um, so bees are extremely, extremely important. And let me see if I can get this to work here. Okay, so um, somebody had mentioned honey. Um, native bees are not honeybees. So honeybees are actually from Europe. They are not native here at all. They're all over the place now. Do you know how they got here? <laughs> they, the Europeans in 1620, so I was talking to my husband about this this morning, um, brought them to this country in, in 1620, which I believe is also the same year the Mayflower arrived. So it could have been the um, that they brought them. They brought them to Massachusetts, which was where people were coming in 1620. And the reason they brought them there is they needed to survive. They used candles. So they used the wax that was produced by the honeybees to make candles for candle wax and also the honey for food, sustenance. So that's how they all got here, but they are not native to this country. Um, so right now they're considered, basically, if you have a beehive and you're raising honeybees, they're livestock. So if you want to say you're saving the native bees, um, that's like saying you want to save the uh, uh, eagles, and so you're going to go out and raise chickens in your backyard. <laughs> it's a completely different thing. So honeybees, they do pollinate, not as well as native bees. They do pollinate, and they do escape and become wild, um, but they are just not as good of pollinators as our native bees. And what will happen is you got all these honeybees out here and they're competing with for resources with the native bees. So, um, they as, considered invasive? No, no, they're not considered invasive. Like so. They're just not, na not native bees and they're not, in, they're not in danger. They're right. not in any, in, they do get diseases and there has been, you probably hear it in the news about diseases that spread through the hives. Anything that lives together like that, if they get a disease, it spreads. Yeah. Um, but they're not in danger, so um, so that's the, the thing about honeybees. Um, so another reason that native bees are better is they all those hairs make them better pollinators. Um, they're especially more effective at pollinating things like apples, cherries, squash, watermelon, blueberries, cranberries, and tomatoes are much better pollinated by native bees than than honeybees. Um, the other advantage of native bees is native bees are tough. They'll get out first thing in the morning and be out there pollinating while the honeybees are sleeping in. And the honeybees go back to the hive um, and go to bed earlier than the native bees. So the native bees spend more time outside. The more time you're out there pollinating, the more pollinating you're doing. Um, so the other thing is they'll do is honeybees, when it's bad weather like today, they stay home. Native bees don't care. They'll go out in cold rain. So they're, they're much better at pollinating than honeybees. So bees can fly in the rain? They probably won't, you know, I mean, if it's pouring down rain, but native bees, I don't know what, what honey bees do because I, I've never raised honey bees, so um, I don't have any experience um, personally with them. Um, so, uh, so now we're going to talk about relationship between um, bees and the plants. Um, generalists are bees that 
uh, go out and they just go to all the flowers and all the all, everything that's blooming and they don't care. So they pollinate. And there's a lot of our neighbor bees are generalists. But there are a few specialists. And we'll, we have one on our list that we're going to talk about. And they only go to certain plants, one plant or certain types of plants. So it's very important that if you're going to have those those plants, and it's I'll tell you, it's the squash bee, squash bees pollinate squash and pumpkins. That's what they do. So that's what they do. So they're specialists at that. Um, and uh, so it's really important if you want your squash and your pumpkins to be pollinated that you try to help the squash bees. And we'll talk about that, how to help them in a minute. Um, social bees and solitary bees. Most native bees are solitary, meaning they live alone. They work alone, they play alone. They have no social structure, no queen, and you know, they have males and females, but they don't have all that social structure that you find between honeybees, which are the most social bees. They always live together. And other social bees, um, bumblebees are social bees. So they do live together, but they don't, they don't make honey, they don't build hive, and they don't um, have a whole hierarchy of workers and all that. It's, they just live together. Um, the social bees can um, tend to have only, I oh know, the solitary bees tend to only have one generation a year. So they'll come out in the spring, they'll live the whole year. Uh, they'll, there'll be a new queen that'll hibernate for next year, and then all of them will die. So that's uh, solitary bees do that a lot. Social tend to have more uh, generations within a year. So some of them two, some of them could have more. So the a little bit of an advantage that the social butter like social butterflies social mm -hmm. bees have is that if something happens to say the one of the um, females or whatever, there's other ones there that just take over and do their job. When they're solitary and something happens to them, that's kind of the end. <laughs> um, bees native to Delaware. Um, you have a piece of paper that I kind of put together for you. Just, just to give you an idea of the sheer number of bee species that exist. So this green sheet here shows the families of bees. And this is, this is um, in, the, in North America, not uh, not worldwide, and not just in Delaware. So uh, of these, you stopped my video? I was trying to zoom in. Oh, okay. keep on. Is it still on? I don't know. It's still on Zoom. OK, so um, the, the sheet. And everybody at home, I, I emailed this to the people who are on Zoom too. So if you want to look at it, um, as you can see on here, there are lots and lots of species in each family. Uh, so the uh, bumblebees are in the Apidae family, and you can see how many gene, gene genera there are, and all of these are the number of species that there are. So. I can't show you a picture of every possible bee that exists. So I'm just going to show you kind of generalized pictures or something. So there's a lot of them. As far as Delaware goes, all of these kinds of bees are native to Delaware. So there's 4,000 species of native bees in the US and Canada, almost. And about 200 of those exist in Delaware. There could be more because keeping records of bees and stuff, that's, that's a lot of work. Um, so they're not sure, but they're estimating there's about 200 species. And there could be species that are in Maryland that aren't in Delaware, but they are coming this way. Um, in your handouts, you have a, a really nice um, page I got from uh, Maryland, common Maryland bees. And these are the same, all of these bees that are on this are present in Delaware. And the interesting thing is these, this one I picked because it has some really awesome pictures. So that's just for your, for your reference. Okay, so um, I'm going to go through some general uh, of, of these in general. 
Um, if you want to write anything down, I gave you a little uh, note sheet that you can use to write down anything you want. You don't have to. It's just sometimes people like to write things down, and that kind of gives you an organized way to do it. Um, so bumblebees. Um, Debbie, you, can, Debbie, can you? This is Claire. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, can you turn on your video? It is on. Um, it is on. Um, no, uh, no, it's not. You don't see it? No, it says Debbie Nicole on the screen. Okay, it's it's on here. Um, so give us a second, and we'll try to figure it out. Okay, Megan's okay. Megan's working on the zoom in. Can you, well, can you see it yet? The share is there, but where uh, where your picture is and actually seeing you and what you're doing is is um, right. That, you're, that you're video is off. off. Okay, but the 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 you can see the screen with the bumblebees. Yes. Okay, that's all you're supposed to be seeing right now. So you're you're good. Um, when when we get to the end of the PowerPoint, I'm gonna work on doing the bee houses, and we'll turn the PowerPoint off, and you'll see me. Okay. Okay. I'm not I'm not doing anything special now. So <laughs> <laughs> just staying in here. Um, so uh, let's see, where was I? Okay, so you can see the number of species. There's a lot of bumblebees. So on this part of the country, there's 28 different species. Um, I actually took that picture myself because um, I take a lot of bug pictures. <laughs> Everybody will tell you. Um, so they are social, like we said before. They are generalists. They're really good about pollinating everything. They're the, one of the most awesome ones. And they're out from when it starts getting warm till it starts getting cold. So you might still see them out now. They stay out longer than, than most bees. Um, so the, there's one generation a year. So the queen will hibernate, the new queen will hibernate um, underground. And then the next year, all, her and all of her babies will have that spend the year pollinating. Um, so where they live is they tend to take over, like if you have a uh, rodents in your yard or your garden, they've dug little burrows under there, they will inhabit those when they're abandoned and they live underground. They don't dig, they just take over spaces that are already underground. Um, and the really cool thing about bumblebees is they use buzz pollination or in the other word for it is sonication. So the, they have this really cool thing and they want that pollen, they're so greedy that they actually take their thorax, the middle section of their body, and they start vibrating it really fast. And when they're in the plant, and what that happens is makes the pollen just poop out, spew out, and it sticks all over them. So that's why they're so great um, at, at pollinating. Um, there's some other bees that do that too, but bumblebees are awesome because they have all those hairs. Um, the other advantage of them, they have um, long tongues. So they can get into those flowers that are really complicated and deep, and they're also strong. Since they're bigger, they're stronger. Have you ever seen a bumblebee just going to town on a flower, knocking it with every which way? They're strong and they can get in there. Um, so they can better get into the complex, complex or flowers and, and pollinate them. How deep do they burrow? They go into burrows that are already there. Okay. Um, so whatever the deep, I don't know what the maximum depth they'll go to, but I think believe I believe when rodents go underground, they kind of go down and then they go across. So they'll go in, in that. But we'll talk more about protecting them underground too. Let me see if I can get my slide to advance. Ah, here we go now. Um, the next type is digger bees. Um, I don't know that I've ever um, seen these. I don't know why it's cutting off the bottom of my slide too. It's not the one on Zoom. Oh, it's not? Okay, no. okay, good. Um, so uh, that's, that's the end of it anyway. The bottom of that says the pollen is collected on the long hairs on their hind legs. So at uh, digger bees, there's only six of them in this part of the world. Um, they are also solitary. They uh, like lots of na native wildflowers. They really love native wildflowers. Um, and they will be out from April to September. They also nest in the ground. They also nest in rotting wood. And they have really uh, hairy back legs. So the pollen is collected on these long hairs on their, on their back legs. They like clay soil. 
they like clay soil the best. So they'll they'll tend to um, nest, nest in a, a bake embankment of clay or in actually adobe walls. If you have a you know adobe brick stuff, they'll actually go into that and make their nest. They do dig. So they, they are the ones, one of the ones that make their make their holes. Um, so the next kind of bee, large carpenter bees. Has anybody had these? Yes. Yeah, they make holes. People don't like them because they're like, they're eating holes in my wood. Um, I have a, my shed has like a little overhang, a little porch on it. And I have a potting bench that I use when I'm potting things up, you know, standing there. And they have, year after year, they come back. They get behind it and they've made nests back there. And I go over there, every time you open the door of the shed, they mm, but they don't sting, they don't bother you, they just buzz around and then they go back. Um, so they uh, they like uh, um, wood, they make holes uh, in rotting wood and man-made structures. Uh, they use the wood that they excavate out of those holes to make uh, cell divisions for their, their offspring. And uh, their favorite kinds of wood are pine and cedar, bo cedar boards. So they like decks and benches that are made out of those materials. And they will come back and use that um, material another year. Um, leaf cutter bees. I, I have these in my garden. Um, they're, they're really cool. You can go out and actually, if, you, if you're looking at your trees, especially, does anybody have a red bud? Yeah. They love red bud leaves. Um, so they will, you can actually see like little, little circular cuts out of the leaves. That's probably a leaf cutter bee. So that's what they use to fill their nest. They actually will take the pieces of leaves and make little tubes inside and put them in there. And then they will take leaf, cut up leaf material and use that to close the, the tunnels. So they're tunnel nesting. Um, they don't make tunnels like carpenter bees. They use tunnels that already exist, um, like our houses. They will use them. If you have, if you do one of your houses and you notice that the hole is filled up with like little pieces of plant, it's probably a leaf cutter bee. Um, there are six types of leaf cutter bees that are not native. They've been, but they're here. They've been introduced. I don't know how they got here, um, but they are. Yeah, and yes, I have a question. Sure. About the carpenter bee, do they use already drilled holes, or do they always drill their own? Um, well, I don't. I don't. I think they always drill their own. I'm not absolutely positive, but they will come back the ones they that they already drill okay. the next year. Okay. Um, Mine come back every year. Yeah, yours do too. Mine do too. And I just leave them alone, let them go pollinate. They're good pollinators because they're so big. Um, so the, the favorite leaves of the leaf cutters, in addition to red bud, they like roses and St. John's wort. They like to pick kinds of leaves that are kind of um, kill, kill, you know, have that antiseptic or anti, you know, germ resistant qualities. It's kind of weird how they do that. So that probably helps keep their nest clean. Um, okay, those are leaf cutters, and I do have these. I want some of those blanket flowers, though. Do you know what their lifespan is? Of, of, of leaf the, cutters? Of the different species of leaves, um, like. It's on your, uh, it's on the, the uh, here, it's kind of the lifespan. So these like emerge in May and they'll go in, in October and the queen will, you know, just lay the eggs for the next year. So they, then they'll all die. There's not, um, they don't, solitary bees only live one year. But some of them like bumblebees, they'll live more like from March all the way to October. So it just depends on when they, when they come out. These guys are a little bit late to come out, the leaf cutters. Um, the longhorn bees, I don't know that I have ever seen one of these in person. Um, the males in particular have a very long antenna. Um, the antenna have, is where they smell. So that's where their, their senses, they get their sense of smell. Those 
um, organs are on their antenna. And uh, sometimes even the females of these bees will have blue or green, light blue or green eyes. So if you ever see a bee with light blue or green eyes, it's probably a female longhorn. So just an interesting little piece of trivia. Um, they like the composite flowers. And this, this com by composite, that's a family of, of flowers. And that family of flowers is like the aster family. So they have, um, in that family is sunflowers, black-eyed Susan, ironweed, thistle, goldenrod, which is blooming now. You see the yellow flowers out on the highways. Um, and asters, which are also blooming now, I believe the purple. So th those are uh, their favorite flowers. So they're, they're kind of generalist, but they really like those flowers in that family. Um, and they're out from June to October when all these things are blooming. They also nest in the ground but the females go back to the nest and the males hang out outside overnight. So they're kind of unique like that. They'll grab a, grab a piece of grass even or anything with their mouth and they'll just sleep while they're hanging on to a plant overnight to the outside. It's interesting, so interesting how many different lifestyle habits they have. I saw flowers are still blooming. Are they? Yeah, I found like some native ones. This is the first year I planted, I guess, the spring. But one of the native plant cells that are always out. Mm -hmm. And they're like awesome. They're in full bloom still. And the good thing about sunflowers, as we'll get into, is the stalks are hollow. Right. So you can use those in your bee house. Oh, okay. When you cut the stalks, cut them down when they're done, you can yeah. put them in the bee house. Okay. Of course, nothing's really going to move into your bee house this year. It's kind of late. Yeah. Um, I tossed around when to offer this workshop, but what I want to make sure the information I get out is what not to do to kill the bees that are already hibernating. So, and then you can put your bee house out like around, you know, next, next spring or whatever. And then the, uh, the uh, mason bees, which we'll talk about in a minute, will actually start using it um, pretty, pretty early in the, in the summer because they hibernate early. Um, so that I think the mason bees is the next one. Okay, this is like one of my favorite bees. So um, mason bees, uh, as you can see, there's 30 different uh, species in this part of the world, and they don't all look alike. So the picture right there is an orchard mason bee. And orchard mason bees are really special because they are desperately needed to pollinate our fruit trees and our blueberries. And that, that is a bee that will use your, your bee house. Mason bees, but some of them, some of them uh, don't look like this. Some of them have, um, they can be black. They can be black with yellow hair all over them. They can be bright green, or they can be this kind of blue, blue greenish color of, of the orchard mason bee. Um, so they nest in already made, they don't make their own holes, but they nest in already existing tunnels like we're going to have in, in your bee house. So uh, mason bees prefer an opening size of 5 sixteenths of an inch. <laughs> they are really picky. Um, so that's the size of hole that I drilled in that bee house that you see there, the block. Um, that's, I got a 5 sixteenths drill bit in all the holes of the parts of that size, just because that I like them and that's for them. Other different bees will take different size holes, up to half an inch, um, all the way down to teeny, teeny, tiny ones that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and there are some species of mason bees that will nest in the soil instead of in a, in a tunnel, but mostly they, they nest in tunnels. Uh, mining bees. Um, these are bees that were at one time specialists, but they kind of evolved over time, and now they like all kinds of wildflowers and berries. Um, so mining bees do live in the ground and they, as you can tell from their name, they do dig out their, their tunnels. They don't live in pre-existing ones, so they mine. Um, so they nest in the ground. Um, they tend to like to nest in the lawn or near the foundation of your house. Um, they'll nest in fields. They will nest in your garden. They like to make their nest under plant foliage which is something else we'll talk about, saving the bees. Um, 
on woodland edges. And another thing they like is they some of them like sandy soil. So they'll be in the, at the beach. So you may see bees coming out of an underground tunnel at the beach sometime. They might be mining bees. And this, as I mentioned earlier, the squash bee is one of our um, few specialist bees that are present in Delaware. Uh, so there's only one species around of squash bees. Uh, they are solitary. They are the ones that pollinate your squash and your pumpkin. They're really important for that. Um, they're out when the squash and the pumpkins are blooming. So that's when they, when they come out. Um, and they like to make their nest in the ground near where squash and pumpkins are. Makes sense. Um, and this is one where nests can be one and a half feet underground, but that's about the max. So they're usually shallower than that, but they can be down that far. Yes, there's a question online. Uh, how do solitary bees uh, reproduce if they die every year? The, the, uh, there's a new queen. One queen survives in most species. And that queen hibernates and makes their, um, lays their eggs. And we'll talk about that when we talk about the, the life cycle of those bees. So they all die except for that queen. It's a queen that was just born. So the old queen will die and a new queen will take over. And, and then it produces all of them for the next year. Okay? Um, small carpenter bees. These are really cool. So these, um, actually when I was, when I was, cutting the, the sticks and stuff for you guys today. I cut one and a bee crawled out and I was so sad. Oh. Oh. I, I suspect it was one of these guys. He was a little, little, little tiny thing. Um, but they like to nest in pithy plant stems or cavities in rotten wood. But they actually, um, if you have, if you cut your sunflowers down, you may notice some of them are still filled. There's not a hole in it. Some will be hollow and some places will have the, the pithy stuff inside. They actually like to take that pith and make and, and ex, excavate it to use it. So they'll clean out the pith and then they'll go in and reuse that pith for cell divisions. Well, that's what's cool about them. So they don't like the ones that are already hollow. They like the ones that have the pith. Um, so the uh, uh, they like to nest in a um, Vertical flower stems. I know this got cut off. Um, so I have a, I grow bronze fennel. Does anybody grow bronze fennel? Yeah. Who? Yeah. You? Yeah. You get a lot of um, eastern black swallowtail. It was my first year growing it, and the place I moved to, the lady that lived there before, there was like not a, not a flower on the property, so I brought uh, everything in. So it was the first year, and they didn't get anything this year, but okay, year, they grow fast. So yeah. mine, I got, I actually got at the Master Gardener plant sale several years ago, and it blooms and it has pollinators all over it. And then it gets um, the, it's in that same group of things that the Eastern Monarch, uh, Eastern, not Monarch, the Eastern Swallowtail butterfly, you know, the black one with the blue um, that you see around. So the caterpillars are kind of green and black and white, and they'll get on there and they'll eat the parsley, they'll eat your dill, They'll eat, uh, they'll eat the fennel. Um, what else do they eat? Yeah, I grew at my old house, I put parsley in and I didn't think I got anything that year. And then I went to like edge around it with the garden that it was in and there was a bunch of caterpillars on it. Yeah. I'm like, yay, yay, good one. Mm -hmm. gotta, gotta grow those caterpillars. Um, so anyway, what was back to the bronze fennel. So when the bronze fennel dies for the year, I cut it back but I leave the stalks sticking up and there they'll be, you know, the stalks sticking up so the bees will actually use it. And I can go back and I see if some of them are hollow. I'll see where they filled it in. It's really cool to watch and look for that. Um, so leave some of your stems. When you cut your sunflowers down, yeah. leave a little bit sticking out, up, you know, who cares? I wonder if winter. those native sunflowers have that same stem as like the big mammoth ones. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I can't yeah, say. There's probably different sunflowers. types. You'll see when you cut them. Yeah, because eventually you have to cut them. When I cut my sunflowers down, I take the heads and I put them 
behind my house because I have some woods and I put them out there for the birds and the wildlife to eat. And, you know, I do that with my pumpkin. I, I collect home. them so that I can free plant them in the year yep. next year. Yeah. So I only have like two blooms this year. But you probably get way more than you want to plant. <laughs> like well, gift them out to everybody. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yep. Um, Last year when I had more, I roasted them and gave them as gifts. Yeah. yeah. I do that with the pumpkin seeds. I don't give them as gifts, but I roast them. Um, <laughs> so sweat bees. Sweat bees are really cool, too. Um, there's a lot of species of sweat bees, and they come in all different colors, all different colors. This one in the picture is a metallic green. So there's actually several species of sweat bees that are metallic green. But they can also be like a, a black and white, brown and white striped thing. So does anybody ever have sweat bee land on that? Land on them? You're not working? Just fly around your head and get it. Get it well, on. they'll land on you because they actually like to um, drink your sweat. So they drink your sweat for the salt and the minerals that helps them, the females do, because it helps them reproduce and be, be healthy to, you know, Will lay their eggs. Yeah, that's all the table. Oh, okay. Bees, uh, native bees don't generally sting you unless you're deliberately bothering them. You try to catch one and hold it in your hands and it's going to sting in defense. But in general, they don't sting you. That's why I just let them fly around. I go in my garden, the bees are flying everywhere. I've mm -hmm. never been stung. The only time I've been stung was when I was a kid and I stepped on honeybees that were all over the clover and sting my bare feet. So I don't think I've been stung since then. Now wasps will chase you down and sting you. And those oh, yeah. bald faced hornets, mm. they're the worst. I know. I've had, um, when I don't go on the helpline, I've had calls a couple of times where somebody said, I have, you know, bees in my house or bees around here and stuff. And they send me a picture or bring one in. It's like, that's not a bee, that's a yellow jacket. So yellow jackets are striped like bees, but they're not bees. And they will, they will chase you down and sting you. <laughs> um, so, uh, as you can see here, sweat bees can be, depending on the species, they can be solitary, they can be communal, meaning they kind of like, like next door neighbors, you know, like they live in, in places that are near each other, um, or they can be social and live together. Uh, they tend to be, if they're existing in a warm place in the south, in a warm area, they tend to be more social. If they are in a cold area or in a high altitude, they tend to be more solitary. So a lot of that, their um, how they how they live depends on where they live. Um, so the social ones can have multiple generations in a year, and um, the metallic green sweat bees are really really good at pollinating things in the nightshade family generally. Uh, tomatoes, potatoes, eggplants, peppers, and they do use that sonification where they vibrate to release the, release the pollen. What's the open flower form? Um, a flower that's not that's not tight closed was more open so it can oh, okay. get to it easy. Like because they're like small flower. Um, yeah, or just anything that's that exposed pollen instead of like something that's that's more harder to get to. Gotcha. And this is the last of the bees we're going to talk about today. I don't know why it's cut off on the bottom. Um, on the bottom, it says it's often mistaken for a wasp. Now, cuckoo bees are different. They're not good pollinators. They are solitary. And what they do is they are actually called kleptoparasitic. They don't have hairs. They look like wasps. They don't have hairs on their body or very few hairs. And the hairs they have, don't, the pollen doesn't stick to them. So what are they going to do? They have to survive. So what they do is they sit outside and they find a bee that has a nest and they wait for that female to go out foraging. And they go in there. And when she's collected pollen for her babies, they lay their eggs on the pollen that she's collected. And when her larvae are born, they kill her larvae so their larvae can have that pollen. So those are mean old bees. So, but they, you, you, if you saw one, you would think it was some kind of wasp because it's not fuzzy. But it's actually a, a species of bee, and there's lots of species of these, and they also cross over into different families. If you look at that chart, you'll see cuckoo bees are in more than one family.
So that was the, uh, those were the examples of bees that I, I showed you. Um, and, oh my gosh, what is happening to my slides? I don't know if you can see this at home, Zoom people, but my slides all stretched out. I'm not sure why. It looks normal on. Yeah, on it looks Zoom. normal. Okay, okay. Zoom people are Zoom people are getting the benefit of getting a better picture. Again. Um, so now we're going to talk about actually the saving of those bees. Um, the uh, native bees. Um, sometimes it's really really hard to have good data because historically there hasn't been a lot of data collected in a lot of places in the world. You know, there's countries in the world that just don't collect data on these. So there's a lot of kinds of bees that we don't really know. You know, if, if the only way you're going to know if it's declining is if you know what it used to be. So if you don't have that historical data, you don't know. So they're, they're working on that now. Um, this map kind of shows, uh, this is the, a map, I, I couldn't find one without that down there because I know I don't expect you to read that. Uh, but this map kind of shows the areas um, where the American bumblebee, a certain species of bumblebee, was counted and researched. And it's found that the areas in red, which includes Delaware, um, most of them have disappeared. So the red is the most, and then it goes down from there, from the, the orange, second most, uh, the yellow, third most, and the green areas is still pretty good. So it's shrinking, it's, it's area uh, that it's covering is shrinking. Um, so why is this happening? Uh, like we said before, we'll talk more about pesticides, overuse of pesticides, you know, pesticide use. I don't use pesticides, a lot of people do, but it's really bad for bees. Um, there are predators uh, of, of bees. Wasps will kill bees. There's like several other things. Birds will eat bees. Um, we're not saying to get rid of all those, but it does happen. Uh, dragonflies will kill bees, robber flies. And then there's a certain kind of wasp called a bee wolf. And the bee wolf will kill bees too. Um, so there, there are those. Um, there's also alien bee species, like, like non-native ones that compete for their resources, like the honeybee. And there's other ones that have been brought in that compete with the native bee for those pollen resources. I mean, there's only so much pollen to go around, right? Somebody gets there first and takes the pollen, then our native bees are shorted. Um, so another thing, climate change is a big thing. And the way climate change is working, and for a lot of things, it's like, say, um, the flowers, so maybe it's a specialist that likes a certain kind of wildflower and that it's getting too hot and that wildflower is, is moving itself north, which it can do faster than the bee can figure it out. So you have this bee that's hibernating and it comes out and its flowers that it wants are no longer there anymore. So that's how climate change, one of the ways climate change is affecting that. So it's the synchronicity uh, between the flowers also. So say the flower um, it's getting warmer earlier in the spring, the flowers bloom earlier, the bees are still hibernating. And there's nothing to pollinate that, and by the time the bees come out, that flower that they wanted might be gone. So those are some of the effects that climate change. And bees will adapt, you know, everything will adapt, humans will adapt. It's just what adapts the fastest are, are the plants. Um, so so we'll, we'll see what happens with that. And then, of course, the biggest problem is loss of habitat. Um, what we mean by loss of habitat is uh, the loss of natural landscapes with native flowers uh, are disappearing from urban development, you know, or, or commercial agriculture. So you got this field with lots of wildflowers and they come in and, you know, mow it all down and bring in bad dirt and make a, a subdivision, you know, and with no, no, nothing but grass. Uh, and that, and that's taken away their habitat. Um, so, and conventional agriculture, even, you know, you have uh, used to have a bunch of flowers sailing, now they've made a field and grown corn or whatever, and the habitat for the, the, uh, the corn doesn't need the bees, it's wind pollinated. So, you know, the bees have nothing to eat. So that's a, that's a big problem. And loss of habitat, as we said earlier, is the biggest cause of the decline in the bee population. Um, so just to reiterate a little bit, um, I found this neat chart, so I decided to include it. Uh, there's a 
about 4,000 native bee species in North America, and about 70% of those bees are ground nesters. And nearly 25% of those bees are in risk of extinction, as you saw from our map earlier. And now I wanna mention this one because this is the only bee, uh, type of bumblebee that is on, officially on the endangered species list, the global endangered species list. Um, so a lot of things are causing this. They're not really sure it's a combination of factors, but there's a lot of research going on right now to figure out what happened to this bumblebee because it used to be everywhere. And now at this point, um, I have that scientists have estimated a decline of 86% in this bee. And uh, also in Canada, um, this bee used to be everywhere. And now it's, they said it's presumed to be absent in 99% of its historical range. So basically gone. Um, and they, they, they're working on it. There, there has been, have been some problems with disease and pathogens and stuff like that. So uh, they're working on protecting it. So by being on the endangered species list, you know that's protected by the, the government. And if, you know, if it's found to exist somewhere, then put a fence around it, don't bother this, you know, no, no construction, no. I mean, my, my husband worked for a US DOT before he retired and part of the stuff they did was, especially in California when we lived there, if they had to build a road, they had to have an environmental um, thing done and he's like, we can't build this road because there's a certain kind of rat that only lives in this area. <laughs> or this insect will destroy the habitat of this certain insect. So that road can't be built there. You have to actually build the road somewhere else. So um, there, when it's protected, it's, it's, it's protected. California is pretty serious about that stuff. My husband doesn't care as much as I do. So. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the rusty patch. If you ever see one of those, you can recognize in this picture is the only one I could find that was close up, but they actually have a rusty patch literally on their back. So if you see one with kind of a more of an orangish colored spot, that's probably a rusty patch bubble. I've never seen one. If you see one, take a picture. <laughs> um, so what can you do? Um, pesticides. Uh, I don't use pesticides. Um, if you do, think about reducing them and not putting them on flowers, especially native flowers that the bees are going to visit. Um, if you have to spray one at all, because it'll drift too. Um, do it when bees, like late in the evening when bees have gone home, most of the bees have gone home and gone to bed. So you don't want to do it when they're out and about. Um, IPM is integrated pest management. If you guys haven't heard of this, this could be a whole another subject. But basically, it's controlling uh, pests first. Before you use pesticide, try cultural, which is things like um, crop rotation to control, like you have squash bugs, instead of spraying them, which doesn't work anyway. Um, try planting squash somewhere else and rotating your crops. Um, things like that are cultural controls ideas. Biological is encouraging, like, uh, um, say you have aphids, you want to encourage ladybugs because they like to eat aphids. Instead of trying to kill the aphids or put pesticides on them, try to uh, plant things that will create a nice habitat for ladybugs and then they'll come and take care of the aphids. So I, I took this, some good pictures this year of uh, aphids on my uh, milkweed. I had aphids on the milkweed and a ladybug was sitting right there. With them. So um, I was like, this is, this is nature in action here. Um, so uh, that's biological control. Um, mechanical control is like just for squash bugs, actually, you, if you find the, the eggs on the leaves, you can actually physically move, remove those eggs. So that's a, like a physical mechanical control. You can use um, row covers to cover your plants to keep the bugs off. Just remember if you have a row cover, um, some kind of a row cover over something that your bees want, they can't get to it. You take the row cover off. So if you're going to do that, you have to, that requires a little bit more work. Um, so those are the kind of things you can do instead. Um, another thing about pesticides is you've heard of systemic pesticides like uh, Roundup, and there's other ones out there where it, it takes it up into the whole plant and the whole system. So bees, bees eat pollen and nectar. They use nectar. If the, if the systemic pesticide is all the way through that plant, it's in the pollen. 
and it's in the nectar. So these are getting poisoned, um, even though you don't think that they're, they're you know, you're bothering them. Um, Neonicotinoids are the worst. Um, they target the nerve system of the bees and they'll make it so the bee can't fly, can't get back to its nest. It's like it, you know, disorients it. Um, so those are a really bad one. And even naturally, de naturally derived pesticides um, like pyrethrins are also harmful to bees. So it doesn't have to be, a, it doesn't have to be a synthetic. It can be, um, it can be even a natural one. And people ask me about neem oil all the time. Um, neem oil is something that if you, in general, it's made from, uh, from the oil from a neem palm. So it's a, it's a plant-based, uh, it's a fungicide and it's an insecticide. Um, but if you're going to use it, just make sure you don't use it when the bees are active because it doesn't harm, it doesn't harm them because it only harms the things that eat it, like the, the beetles that eat it. Um, and you have to keep applying it a lot. So if you're going to use neem oil, I know somebody would ask about that. Um, don't do it while the bees are out. What about what the vinegar dawn weed killer? Um, that I, I use that on, my husband uses that on the sidewalks because I took his roundup away. Yeah. I literally did. I literally made me so mad. He killed stuff he wasn't supposed to kill. He's like, well, I didn't spray it right on it. It's like, if you spray it on something next to something, it's systemic. If it gets in it, it suck it up right up. You know, you can't do that. Um, so I literally took all this round up and I did it. <laughs> and I let him use vinegar on the things that are in the cracks, and that's it. Yeah, at my old house, I had it like the gravel driveway. Yeah. And that's what I would use that yeah. for. With a, no, so with that, now vinegar is not systemic. Vinegar kills. Vinegar is not systemic like oh, around yeah. that. So if you kill, if you spray it on the top of the plant, you'll know it'll turn brown really fast. Yeah. Um, like twenty or thirty percent, but it doesn't kill the roots. It only kills the part touched, so it'll grow back. But usually, if I kill them, it makes them really easy to. If it makes them easier to pull up, because if they're in the cracks between stones and things, they're really hard to to get out after yeah. life. Um, okay, now we're going to talk about native plants. So what I want to show you is I got you these really cool books. And if you guys are on Zoom at home, um, these books are a lot of color and a lot of pages. But if you download the PDF, you can read them on your computer. Um, that's all. That's about all I could do for you. If you're local, um, let me know if you want a, a hard copy because I have some extras and I'll figure, I'll figure out if I can get it to you. Um, if you look at this one that says uh, Delaware Native Plants for Native Bees, this book right here is very specific about what plants you can plant. And the really cool thing in the center here is this little chart, look in the middle, and this shows um, what all these native plants that are in Delaware and what months they're blooming. And it's trees and flowers, because trees, trees have, flowers too, even though you might not see them, um, that still have pollinators coming to them. So this is good because what we want to do, um, plant native plants, native bees like native plants. That's what they evolved eating. Um, if you have invasive things that are going to outcompete those natives, that are going to kill them, try to get rid of the natives so the, I mean the invasives so the natives can grow. Um, that's a whole other topic too, is invasive species. Kathy and I did something on replacing uh, invasive plants with native plants a, a while back. my so. biggest task at my new house is I had like a third of the yard was covered with English ivy, which yeah. I despise, and it is all officially gone, although I'll be fighting it for years to come, but at least it's not there. Yeah, right and you can now. put something else in its place that's native easily. So talk to Kathy, she's an expert. <laughs> um, so, uh, Another thing is if you want your garden, your cucumbers and everything to be well pollinated, try to get some flowers near your fruits and vegetables so that the bees go there while they're visiting their favorite flowers, their wildflowers that also go to your tomatoes and your, your uh, okra and your um, peppers and things like that while they're there. So it's important to have flowers near your garden to attra attract the bees to pollinate your, your fruits and vegetables. Um, so this chart is what's really good for the last one. Plant for bloom throughout different seasons. As you saw before, the bumblebees are out from March till October. 
So they want to, they need pollen that whole time. If you only plant something that bloom, blooms in April and that's it, they, they only have food for April and they're going to go somewhere else to find it. Um, they can travel, so but you'll lose them to, as far as your garden. You want them there to pollinate other things. They'll go somewhere else if there's nothing there for them to eat. So that's this chart. I found this this thing online. You can get this information um, on the Native National Park uh, site if you want that. There's a whole card about it. So this is just um, a, another example. So I'm sure all of those are, are in here too. But this chart is much better than, than the one that's on the slide. So I just wanted to show you that. Um, so flowers attract bees because of the colors. They can see color. So they see it, then it'll attract them. They can also smell it. And also some flowers have evolved to put out little sensory things that they can detect. Like I read something about even some kind of like little electric thing that they'll do to attract it. So, you know, that, that's, that's why it's good to have flowers near your vegetables because your vegetable, uh, the blooms on your vegetables aren't as nice and big and pretty as, as some of the flowers that you get. Um, and uh, so bees can also see ultraviolet wavelengths. So if you see any flowers that have kind of a stripe pattern or something, it can find those by ultraviolet things and it attracts them to it. So it's really cool. People can't see the, the, the um, glow that it's putting out. Um, I'm going to show you all the books in a minute, but I have really good books recommendations that are on your list of resources too. That's on the back of your packet here um, for uh, native plants for bees. Okay, and then the other thing, what we're talking about. Remember, 70% of the bees nest underground. Okay, so we want to protect those bees. Um, so provide a safe shelter and let them. Leave them alone if you see them in the ground. Um, and then we're also going to talk about the bee houses. Um, cleaning up your garden. I'm sure you've heard this. My garden is, is pretty much done. My vegetable garden is kind of overgrown and messy. Leave it alone. Bees are making take an opportunity to hibernate in there. So if you try to pull up everything, all that dead stuff out of your garden now, you're disturbing the soil where bees might have already gone to bed. So that's one way you can protect them. Um, they like to, a lot of them like to nest under the leaves. So in the fall, when the leaves fall, they, you know, and I'm sure you hear this anyway, leave the leaves, right? It's the new thing. You don't rake them up. They compost. They help your soil. They're good for a lot of things. Leave the leaves. If you have old logs that are rotting away, as long as they're not causing any trouble, leave something for the, for the things that like to nest in rotting wood. Tree stumps, you know? Of getting a tree stump pulled out, leave it for the for the bees. Um, like we said earlier, the hollow plant stalks. When you cut down your sunflowers and everything else, leave those stalks up. They're not hurting anything over the winter, right? You know, is there a certain the amount like. of, of length that you should like when you cut your fennel back and stuff? Is there a certain? I leave about so much, but yeah, okay. It's not a cut. It's not a hard and fast rule. You know okay. for that. Just don't. I mean, that wouldn't be enough. Right. So I would say at least six inches. Okay. And we'll talk about the six inch thing too with the mason bees. Um, and uh, a lot of bees look for bare ground to nest. So if you can, by any chance, you have a, a, a bare spot, um, especially if it's sandy for some of those mining bees, um, leave it and, and let, because the bees like, some of the bees like it. They won't, they won't make a hole. Uh, a nest in ground that has plants on it. They want the bare ground. So if you have some bare ground that looks like it's being used, let it, let it alone. Um, tilling. Now, as you can see from this picture here, showing the, uh, I found this, this thing on Facebook, actually. It's really so cool. I'm like, I have to, I have to use that. Um, so it's uh, the bee, bumblebee has its nest underground. If you run a rototiller through there, what's going to happen to that bee's nest? Um, yeah. So um, I don't, I use, all my gardening is in raised bed, so I don't till anything. And, and you know, I know um, one of our really, really environmentally conscious master gardeners, she does complete no-till. She just layers and plants in new layers every year instead of tilling up. Um, so if you, if you go without tilling, um, if you till, it can destroy that, it destroy the nest. And even if you think you're just tilling lightly, um, some of those nests, they have to, have a place where they come in and out and if you close off that entrance 
then they can't kick it out. So, um, so those are some of the things, other things you can think about. Okay, so now we're going to talk about these bee houses. Um, these bee houses are not used by all bees. Of course, the ground nesters, the 70% need, need the ground. Um, but what we're going to talk about here is building a bee house for mason bees and leaf cutter bees will, will use these. They are not the ones that drill their own holes like um, carpenter bees and mining and all these other ones that, uh, that make their own holes. They use pre-existing holes. So that's why it's important to put something out there like the stalks and things that, that they can live in. Um, so different bees like different sizes. Like I said earlier, mason bees, I read that they prefer 5 sixteenths of an inch hole. So if you wanna write that down, um, there's, there's that. Um, I bought a, a, a long drill bit that was five, six, five sixteenths of an inch to make all these holes and things. Um, the, when the bees lay their eggs, they start in the back and work their way forward. So it needs to be closed in the back. If it's open in the back, they'll, I can't use this. You know, it's gotta be closed. It's gotta have a starting point for them to start laying their eggs. So um, you have a back to the bee house. Um, they need to stay out of the weather as much as possible. So an overhang, like the ones that you have here, have a little bit of an overhang. Uh, if you can possibly have, you know, the eaves of the house, if you have a south facing uh, side of the house that has some eaves, uh, you can put it up under there, give it a little bit of more protection from the weather. Um, <clears throat> they don't like to swing in the wind. So if you, your bee house is here, I've attached a, a little loop on the top and the bottom. So if you, if you screw it in on the top through the bottom too, so it doesn't, it'll, otherwise when the wind blows, it'll swing around and bees don't like that. So keep it stable. Um, they like to face south or southeast because they like that warmth. The warm air in the spring will tell them to come out of hibernation. Um, so they, they need to be in the, facing the south or the southeast. That's the best. Um, and you want to make sure that when they come out in the spring, they have something to eat. So you want to put your bee house near where your wildflowers are growing in the garden. Um, I noticed that these are on a tree. So if it's a big shade tree, if it's not a really tall tree, do you recommend that? Um, that's fine. Yeah, you can attach it to a tree. Mine are attached to. Um, I have this old piece of a trellis, but it's like wood that's like this, which also the carpenter beetles have gone in. And um, just make sure they're at least three feet high or a little bit higher. Okay. So they don't want to be really low. And do squirrels tend to mess with these? I have not seen any squirrels mess with these. There's nothing for a squirrel to eat. Now birds will. Birds will. Birds will peck in there and try to get this, the larva out. Spiders will, any of those predatory insects. If you see a spider web, or near it, I would gently like try to encourage it to go somewhere else because they will um, Okay, so uh, in your, if you want to look in your packet, I found this awesome uh, document online. Um, the one that says building and Man managing bee hotels. All the information I've been talking about was in here. And then the, the next slide, um, slide. This, this, uh, this is what we're going to talk about now. This is actually in your packet. So you don't have to write it down. You, you have it here. Um, so this is like the life cycle. We were talking a lot about the life cycle of the bees. So you see up here where it says number one, um, that's the bee coming out of hibernation in the spring. Now, this, this guy will come out um, depending on what kind of bee it is. Mason bees will come out as early as March. Uh, the leaf cutter bees come out later. So depending on which bee is using it, they come out at different times. So you can't go exactly by the, the dates on here. So number one, the bee comes out. It does its thing here. Um, <laughs> yeah, does this little, it has a little bit of time there. And um, the female, you know, has, makes her eggs and shortly after she starts preparing her nest. 
So um, right here in the spring, she'll start collecting, see all the pollen in her mouth? Start going out and collecting that. She starts in the back. So she goes all the way to the back, makes a little, sets down her pollen, lays one egg on that pollen. That pollen is there for the, her baby to eat. Lays the egg, and then she'll go out. If it's a mason bee, she'll go get some mud. They like mud. Take the mud, and she'll make a little wall. And then she'll collect more pollen, put it in the next cell, lay one more egg, make another wall. Now the cool thing is, she'll let she'll start when the, when she lays her eggs. Those will be the ones in the back will be the females, female baby bees. So I thought this was really cool. As they get to the front, they'll do the males to the front towards the end, and the males are are um, hatched from unfertilized eggs. How that happens, I don't know, but I thought it was fascinating. So that they they always do it so the males can come out first. The um, the males don't collect pollen; they collect they collect nectar. Their sole purpose in life is to fertilize the females. So they just eat the nectar, and the females do all the work. Um, so this is a good picture. I like this picture of the little baby larva coming out and they just munch away on that on that pollen. And then what happens is later on, um, they get they get bigger and then they pupate. And depending on what season is and what type of, of bee it is, they will overwinter either as a pupa or as a kind of a, an adult or somewhere in between. They'll just go into like some suspended animation when it gets cold and just stay in there. So basically, you, that's the time you just need to leave everything alone and let it do its thing. And then what will happen in the spring, you can tell they come out because if you see that mud, and I love going out and looking, I look in my bee house and I'm like, oh, that was there going in there because it's got little mud, my little mud cap over there. But you'll know they've come out because you'll see where they poke the hole through and come out. So the ones, of course, on the outside, the males will come out first, and then they'll work their way back. So that's the whole life cycle. Like we said, these um, solitary bees, this is the, the progress through the year. So one year's worth of, of growth. And then the one queen will survive and make, it, make a new nest the next, next year, and it continues. So, but there's more about that in your, on your, uh, in your handout here. Because that's important to know when you're making your your uh, hotel and managing your your bee house, what's going on in there. And then, last but not least, when I went over to uh, Department of Ag to get some of the, more of these books, um, the lady over there was nice enough to give me just hand me uh, copies of this because I didn't have enough for you all. Um, she said, "Be sure you tell them." that if they have a dirty bee house and you don't keep it clean and take care of it, it's, it's worse than having no bee house at all. Because what it'll do is they'll get diseases from each other and they'll get contaminated and then they'll die. I've seen videos, I, I don't do this and I don't think I will do this, but I've seen videos on YouTube where they actually um, put paper straws in the holes and pull them out when all the pupa are in there and take them out and wash the little pupa. And then put them in the refrigerator and then take them out. I would be afraid to do that because first of all, I would feel like I was going to damage them and kill them by doing that. But I prefer to let nature take its course. But if it's not, if it's if you get it, uh, you know, you leave it year after year after year without cleaning it, you're just going to get it contaminated and then it's going to it's going to not going to be really unhealthy for the bees. So how do you take care of it? Um, <clears throat> You can use a uh, mild bleach, like a quarter of a cup and a gallon of water. Um, I would take the, the things you have here and every year clean out the inside of that. Um, clean or replace the nesting tubes every season. Now, nesting tubes are these. Um, the idea of taking bleach and cleaning every single one of these doesn't appeal to me. But fortunately, in Delaware, we have um, all these materials readily available. And one of the things I one of the things I got um, right here, I just cut these yesterday. These are a good thing that they like to nest in are the Phragmites or the native reeds that you see in all the swampy areas growing up and down all the sides of the roads. So there's plenty of material out there in Delaware in nature readily available. So I'm not going to I'm not going to clean mine. I'm going to throw them out and put new ones in every year. So I mean you can you can clean them if you want, of course, but the thing is don't don't leave them. Don't 
don't leave them dirty. Um, so you can also, if you want, if you have kids you really like, um, you can use these, and we might want to use these today. Some of these might have some sawdust or something in them. But pipe cleaners, just regular pipe cleaners, are good for putting through there and cleaning the extra stuff out of the inside of the tubes. We have a couple questions. Yeah. Online. So um, Claire uses an anaerobic nematode in her soil before planting in the spring. Does this farm bees? I don't. I don't believe so. I mean, the 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 uh, things like that that you're putting out there for the nematodes eat the plants. So um, I don't, I think if you're trying to help the good nematodes and stuff, and I've done it before, I don't think it should bother the bees, but um, we can always look that up, but I, I don't think it would. And then her second question is, how does she get the handouts if they're, if they're online? You'll send them to um, her. I, I, they should be on her, atta attached to her email. Oh, there you go. They should be attached to your email. Yeah, I think everything I attach. Now the resources page, if you look at, if you're on Zoom and you want a copy of these uh, book booklets I'm talking about, if you go on that resources page, you can link to them. These were huge files, so I couldn't email them to you, but I have the link where you can download them. Oh yeah, that's on your resources page. Um, so uh, um, mesh bags, um, if you're really concerned about something getting into your bee house, you can cover cover it with a mesh bag, put the whole thing in a mesh bag or something, and that'll keep out the, the predatory insects and stuff until the bees are ready to come out. Of course, you can't leave it on there when they're ready to come out. But if you want to protect it over the winter, you can cover it with something. Yeah. So there's another question. What is the time frame for cleaning after the bees have emerged? Yes. And how long do we have? After they've emerged. Good question, because you know what you can do too. Uh, a good thing to do is have two bee houses and alternate them year to year. So that when you um, when you are ready to clean your bee house and replenish it and everything else, take it down and put the other one up immediately. Do it after the bees have emerged. When you see, if you see that mud, make sure all the, the cells are, are empty. Um, if you have leaf cutter bees in there, they'll come out later. So just because the mason bees have emerged doesn't mean there's not other bees in there. So you have to be observant and see if they've, if they've opened up and they've come out. Now, if it gets to be, you know, um, late and they're still closed, you know, then, then they probably didn't make it for some reason. Um, but it, they should, you should be able to see where they come out. When it looks like it's empty, you can clean it out. You can use pipe cleaners and get all the extra stuff out of there. You can just, you know, like I said, take everything out, toss it, put all new stuff in. So um, if you're cleaning them out, when do they start using that nest to build their nests? Or their it, be, it depends on the variety of the, okay. of the, the mason bees will start using it in um, like, I think like August or so. Um, I think their season went till July. Yeah, and then they come out early, but then the other ones, the, the leaf cutters, they come out later and they stay out later, so they overlap. And how um, do you know that a reed is empty? Like, because if they're doing it in cells, you can't Because if they filled it up, they'll fill it all the way to the end, and it'll be right. closed. So you'll know they weren't in there if it's closed. So they all come out at the same time? They come out, well, the one on the outside comes out, then the next one, then the next one, yeah. Meaning like in the same day, like it's not. One will come out one week, one will come out another week. You know, I don't know what the yeah, I don't know if they do it at the same I don't know if they do it in the same day. Oh, I don't know how long it takes to empty a empty a empty a tube. Um I'm not sure. But if you see that they you know, if it's open and you don't see any activity, you know, then it, then it should be okay. Um but you just don't want to keep a dirty one out there because then it'll promote diseases and things like that. Um, so protecting the larva from birds, um, I have a, I have a bee house that has a piece of screen over the front. It's kind of coarse screen, so I'm not sure, but, uh, birds will eat larva, birds eat worms, larva are worms to them. So, um, they will, if they can get to them, they could eat them. And then of course you don't want your house to get too wet and get, um, moldy and get, you know, fungus and all that stuff in it. So try to keep it from getting too wet, um, by, by, making sure it's uh, sheltered somewhat. Ants will take over, paper wasps will take over, and they are predatory, they will eat those. 
Um, I have a lot of paper wasps at my house. They make nests everywhere, but they pollinate. So unless they're like really bothering something, um, I don't get rid of it. And just remember that if you're not gonna, if you don't wanna take the, the extra time to take care of it, then it's not worth having it at all because you'll just get how sick bees and we don't want sick bees. So um, the uh, resource list is, I'm gonna show you some books and all of these documents, if you wanna download them and the ones that are in here are, are on this list, which is in your packet. And, I am going to stop sharing my presentation so that we can look at uh, some bee houses. Let me figure out how to do this. And you should be able to see us now. Can you at home see me now? Uh -huh. They said you were tiny. I shouldn't be tiny. So for those of you at home, the booklets I was talking about that you can download, um, if you go to your resources attachment there, and, and uh, it's, a, it's a PDF, uh, the link should work. You just download it to your computer and you click on those links and you can, you can put this on your computer if you want to read it on your computer. Like I said, they're full color and have a lot of pages. So printing it might not be practical, um, but if you really want to print the copy, just contact me and I'll see what I can do. Um, so I want to show you some really good books before we start the bee houses. If, you, if you're really interested and you want to... Um, it was better with the lights on. Better than I, I guess if, we can even, can we turn the projector off? Well, I tried to zoom in and that's when it cut it off. Oh, it's just like this bright green light. Mm -hmm. um, so this book, I love, I love, love, love this book. Um, this is uh, Bees and Identification and Native Plant Forage Guide. So this book has the first half of it is all about all the different bees. There's lots of pictures, there's lots of information. There's more ID information, which I didn't include about like sizes of the bees, which varies so much. I didn't bother, but in here it gives you a lot of range of the sizes. So if you see a bee of a certain size, you can go look it up. And then the second half of this book is all native plants. And it also shows where they grow. It's all the different types of native plants. So this, if you're going to get one book about this, I would highly recommend this. This is great. Um, if you're really, really interested in just identifying the bees that you have, this is just a little like a little pocket guide, common native bees of eastern United States. So it really is just a little cardboard like a field guide and has little pictures, um, some pretty good pictures of all the different types of bees. Not a lot about plants, more about bees. Okay, right? so if you're interested in that. And then if you're really interested in native plants for your bees, uh, this book is put out by the Xerxes Society, um, 100 Plants to Feed the Bees. Um, so this is all about the native plants. So it's like, a, you know, page after page with all kinds of things. All kinds of pictures um, and then ranges of where they grow and all kinds of information. So this one does, talks less about bees and more about plants. So it just depends on where you, where you want to go with that. Um, so those are some, some recommendations. Like I said, the information is on your resources page there. Okay, now, um, what time is it? Right. We're probably going to go over time. I hope that's not going to bother you guys. A little, a little time to get started here. So if you guys at home can see this, um, this is a bee house like everybody here. Do I need to move? There you go. This is a, uh, is the camera, is that the camera? That's the camera. <laughs> um, this is the bee house that's like everybody here has one of these because they came today um, the, that we built. So this bee house meets the specifications that are, are in that document I sent you. So this is six inches deep. You can see I uh, stained it with some leftover green stain that my husband used for something and I painted little decorations on the side just for fun. So you can, you can take yours home, you can stain it, you can paint it, you can 
stick decals on it. You, they don't care. You can do any of that stuff. Um, so this is uh, made out of, is this pine, Megan? Wood? I think so. I think they're made out of pine. Uh, you don't want to use treated wood, so any untreated wood should be okay. The roof is cedar, um, because I thought it was cool. So put cedar on them. There's a, you, you guys probably have different patterns on yours because I, I bought this on Facebook Market and there was like a whole bunch of scraps. So some of them are pieced together and some of them are whole, so depending on which one you picked up. Um, so those are cedar roofs. They should hold up pretty well. If they don't, if the roof rots, you can always replace it with something. Just make sure you get a, a, about an inch, a recent inch of an overhang to keep out you know, the rain from going directly in there. Um, so this one I stuffed with a variety of different types of tubes, and I'm going to show you what those are. Uh, so you can probably see these little logs. So we drill holes in the logs. Um, these, these would be something that if you had a really nice log, you might consider cleaning instead of throwing out. The rest of the stuff could be thrown out. Um, thrown out. Uh, Kate back here, thank you, Kate, my, my right-hand woman, went out on her property and cut a whole bunch of bamboo. So bamboo is a good hollow skin thing that we can use. Um, and we have a whole bunch of it here that you guys are going to be able to put in your houses before you go. Um, so bamboo, um, another thing, like we said earlier, sunflowers. Uh, this pile here is a mixture of sunflower stems and uh, some of my bronze fennel. So that's there. Hopefully no bees will crawl out. Mm -hmm. I think if they were going to, they would have by now. So there's bamboo, there's sunflowers. Um, there's plenty enough of bees that are drilled. If you want to put a log in there with some holes, these are 5 sixteenths of an inch holes. Some of them have two holes and some of them had one hole. The fattest one had three holes. So that's what that looks like. Of course, you can always make your own. You know, if you cut, if a branch falls off a tree or you prune a tree and you have some of these left over, cut them six inches long and drill some holes in them. Just make sure you keep the back closed. So I use a long drill bit so it goes as deep as it can. Um, let's see. So you, if you have a back to the yeah. yeah, I guess I guess if it goes all the way through and you have a back, you don't have to worry about it. Another option that you can do, um, and I've seen this before, is if you if you have a sheltered area, you can just take a whole bunch of, of these tubes and tie them up with twine. Don't use a rubber band. Tie them up with twine and hang them, and just close the close one of the ends. So you can, you'll have to either like if they're soft enough, you can pinch them or put something in the back so that they're close to one end. But you can take bundles and hang them up, and they'll use those too. So if your bee house goes to you know rots, you can do that. Um, show you these, but these are the these are the leaves. These are just the phragmites that grow beside the road. The ones we found the other day are pretty thin, but they have a a hole. And remember, if you find something and it's pithy, it could be used by a carpenter, a, a small carpenter piece. So just because it's not hollow, completely hollow, doesn't mean it can't be used. And last but not least, if you really can't find any of these, you can purchase these. Um, these are specially made for bee houses. They're just cardboard. So these are cardboard tubes. You can put them in there, in there, and they are the right size for the mason bees and other bees will use them. Of course, you know, the, if these get wet, they're not as sturdy, but, um, but then, of course, they're easy to replace. You can just buy more, if you don't mind. So would you recommend minutes. paper straws then? Um, paper straws are usually used more for lining. Like, like I said before, they'll use them as a liner for the wooden things. Um, you could try them. Um, they might not be sturdy enough. But what you don't what you uh, what you don't want to use is plastic straws. Plastic straws are no no. So, but these are just cardboard. These are specifically made for bee houses. So, but um, and then before I let you guys come get some stuff for your bee houses, um, I wanted to let you know that uh, this is another option. So you might see these if you're out somewhere where they grow fruit trees. You might see, go see something stuck up on a post and go, what the heck is that? You know, um, This is for the mason bees to come and live in and pollinate those fruit trees. 
very important pollinators of fruit trees. So if you see orchards, you might see some of these. So this is just a solid block of cedar with a piece of cedar on the top for a little roof, keep the weather out. And I took, uh, make sure if you're gonna drill holes, they need to be about three fourths, at least three fourths inches apart. Because you know, you have to drill straight or else they'll run into each other on the inside. So it's kind of tricky. I did it instead of letting my husband because everything he does is crooked, so. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I it straight in. And, uh, and that was what I came up with. So it may not be spaced perfectly, but. You said how far to space the limit? Um, no closer than three fourths inch. And I believe the, the directions for doing this are also in your packet and that in that document about building a, a bee house. There's a, examples of this. And I believe also in this other book that I gave you. Um, this one is, is supposed to be for farmers, but it's got a lot of good information. It's only in the very end where it talks about farming aspect. But there's there are things in here too about this house, I believe, on Yeah, on page uh, 14, it also describes how to build one of these in this book. But this book is really good too. It talks a lot about, um, you know, not tilling and not uh, disturbing the areas where the bees are nesting. Okay, I was trying to think if there was something else I was going to show you. Um, so, um, Debbie, can I just say a quick thing? You, sure. Earlier, somebody asked, can you just hang them on the trees? And um, I would just caution people to not like take a hammer and nail into the tree. It only takes about 10 poles like that to kill a tree because mm -hmm. the nutrition and the water comes up, up the trunk. So you can like use nylon thread or use something to thread through and maybe have maybe there's a branch here and you just got it over the branch yeah. and then you do the bottom one nice and you tight. Still want to swing yeah. yeah and then then make sure you change out that thread the following year because trees get they get wider so you know what so, happened to me when i tried to tie a, i had a bat house and i tied it to a tree with um actually zip ties squirrels kept knocking it down squirrels kept eating through the zip ties and knocking down the tree so that's another thing about if you're putting it in a tree, you got to know that, you know, squirrels might bother it in a tree where they might not bother it if it's on a post because there's no food for it if it's on a post. But, um, but, but yeah, good. Um, we never want to put nails in living trees. So if it's a dead tree, you're good. Leaving that old dead tree stump and it's high enough, that'll work. Um, so, uh, how about, do you guys want to come up here and get the materials or should we pass them out? You want to come up? Yeah. Okay, um, so just make sure to share. <laughs> Don't somebody fill up their, fill up their house with logs because there's not enough for everybody. So it, is, it, said, it reminds me of my bacon story where uh, my, uh, one of my daughters was visiting and invited my other daughter's family over for breakfast. And I had two pounds of bacon that I cooked. And my grandson and son-in-law had it all up on their plates and yes. nobody else had any bacon. Sounds about right. Sounds about right. I guess do. I guess he's still he's still doing that. My daughter said she made hot dogs and he, there were like enough hot dogs for everybody to have one, and he took like three. <laughs> my 18 year old grandson i guess he's hungry so. <laughs> um so uh yeah so make sure you take a look take some and leave some you guys can come up here i also brought um some sanding blocks because some of these are a little rough on the edges so if you feel the need to smooth them out a little bit these are here too so um but come take you're free to take whatever it takes i don't I can't promise there's enough here for everybody to completely fill your house. Um, we collected as much as we could. I know that it was hard to, we were trying, Kate and I were trying to figure out how many pieces does it take, and it's going to depend on what size they are and everything else. So um, you can see about how much it takes to fill up one of these. Um, so, so, you know, you might want to take some and then um, let everybody get some and then come back and get some more. If we, but you guys are free to have everything I have up here.
There's more underneath the table. Yeah, there's more bamboo in a box down there. Um, you can't have this. <laughs> I'm going to take one. I have, I have apple trees in Canada, so I'm going to take I made two of these. I'm going to take one. the release, right? I don't think they're just kind of robust. Those bitch lilies? Yeah, those are actually invasive. Are the steps good ones the lily? Oh, I don't know. They they are hollow. I'm pretty sure. Are they hollow? Are lily? Yes. There's lots of things that are hollow. Right? Yeah. Um, I think I read a bee bomb. Bee bomb stems are hollow. The hydrangeas. Hydrangeas. Yeah. I get the sea stuff. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. They'll take, they will take advantage. They will take the opportunity to get into any of those things. So, um, they have the, you know, like I said, it can even have pith in it. So there's those certain kinds of bees that use that pith. They excavate it and use it to use the clean it So, but they do have to dry it out. So they're still green or no good. Um. Yeah. Everything up here should be dried out. I mean, the ones you're speaking about. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't think, I think if you use them, it'll dry out. It, once you hang it up, it'll dry out fast enough. So it dries up. I cut those reeds the other, I cut, harvested those reeds the other day. And my husband's like, these are too green. These aren't going to work. And then I think by the time I got to cut them, they were all dry. So. Work at your table. Yes, I was thinking. Whatever you like. Work Oh, you just see this <laughs> Yeah. No, the a lot of the journalists There was a question of can there be a variety of whole sizes? Yes. Yep. I think that the document um, that I gave you has a range. I think no bigger than like half an inch. But down to well, now that we're we're up and moving, it's probably difficult to hear. So, um, thank you to everyone that joined online, and uh, hopefully, we'll see you at the next hybrid workshop. Thanks a lot. <laughs>